Claudia Upopa is a cybersecurity expert who's worked in the risk assessment industry for over 25 years, and he's in studio now to talk about how we can protect ourselves. So it was interesting to me to learn that she didn't have her wallet stolen, nothing that would lead you to believe that her identity could be easily used by someone else. So how can this happen? Your identity can be just as little as your name. So all that a hacker needs nowadays is your email address to send you emails. In many cases, she may not remember having clicked on something, or maybe they didn't even bother with a phishing or a spear phishing uh, strategy, as was employed with the Sony hack, for example. Okay. They could just make up information and create passports and birth certificates and driver's licenses in her name without any other piece of ID. Well, and I know that the advice is not to give out so much information online, and I, I get it in, in the context of social media, but if you're trying to purchase something online, for instance, they always want certain information. I know I've had this frustration where you think, well, you don't really need my phone number but you can't get it to go through unless you give them the information in the highlighted field so how do you work around that that's right uh, in many cases you have to be cognizant of what information needs to be in their hands and what information they just need for contacting you right. and those can be two different things so for example I always recommend using disposable emails or specific emails for e-commerce transactions so anyone knows that they can get a, a free uh, Gmail address or Yahoo address or Hotmail address or a hundred of them. But what about getting disposable email addresses, for example, ones that can only receive 10 emails and then disappear? Mm -hmm. And that way, if it ends up on any number of spam lists, it'll be useless after you receive the first 10 emails. I want to show you some footage that was part of an undercover investigation with hidden cameras that I did with our investigative unit a couple of years ago, showing the kind of ID that people can get. We took hidden cameras into some of these little stores on Young Street and showed that kind of fake ID that you know people may remember from 20 years ago has really become sophisticated. We're showing some of the things that you could buy on the wall and what really struck with me, uh, stuck with me, and I wanted to share this with you today, is when we were seeing people making these cards, they were often using real addresses. They weren't even some made-up address. It was coming out of a phone book from different cities. That's right. They're not hard to find. And, and these cards were very persuasive and easy for people to be fooled by. Even police that we showed them didn't automatically know that it was off. So how do we protect ourselves from something like that? It's getting much more difficult. And in many cases, uh, 2015 is going to be a, a turning point in both user and victim awareness and in the way law enforcement protects against this type of crime. Why? Because identity theft in itself is changing. And so it's changing into something called synthetic identity fraud, where all they need is one element of your identity, and they can make up the rest or borrow it from other people, other unsuspecting people, and create synthetic people that just don't exist, make up names with real addresses, and put them out there creating all these certificates and go on and open up accounts in their names. So we've seen people victimized by it. We've shown how easily it can be done. You're in risk assessment. You know how easily it can be done. Why is it still happening that the banks are being fooled at the expense of customers? One reason for that is that uh, banks and financial institutions in general are not going public with all of these things that they're seeing out there. They're seeing an awful lot of identity fraud, a lot of heists, cyber heists as we call them, uh, theft, data theft or financial theft. They're seeing a lot of this, but because of concerns around reputational damage, there's not as much communication as there should be. And so uh, situations like the one that uh, you, just, you just outlined are much more prevalent than people think. This is just one rare case that chose to go forward. And it just so happened that it happened three times. But in many cases, banks will come back and say, okay, we'll, we'll deal with it. We will reimburse your money. You haven't suffered at all. Don't worry about anything. And so it becomes difficult for the victim to actually speak out or to blog about it. They, people have lots of other things to do. They're just happy to be rid of that, that issue. And so in many cases, the public does not get to benefit from this added knowledge that could be there if financial institutions and the victims themselves could speak out. And I'm glad we're doing that now. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Claudia Popa is a cybersecurity expert who joined us in studio. The best advice there, I guess, hang on to your information. It's like currency for someone. Also today, the Canadian military says it has helped stop the expansion of ISIS in Iraq. But 
It also admits that the battle to defeat the Islamist rebels could take years. So what next? More on that when we come back.